Hello, everybody. I hope you'll um, please get settled in. We have plenty of seats this month, which is just wonderful. Um, so thank you all so very much for being here. I'm Mary Logsdon here at the Ames Public Library, and I'm just so delighted that this year we've entered into a partnership with Ames Historical Society to bring its wonderful uh, history lecture series here to the public library. You are um, fortunate to be here at the third of four lectures this semester, this spring. The next um, program will be in June, so I hope that you will come back in June for the final, um, the final program. And uh, also, if you haven't already heard about it, please take a moment to um, pick up a card that is giving information about exploring Ames past, and that's the Main Street Cultural District activity that's occurring this weekend. Um, so you'll want to check that out as well. Um, and feel free to ask any of us about that if you're curious about what that is all about. I hope that you will um, just sit back and enjoy the evening. We are really fortunate um, tonight to have as our presenter the person that I would have I would have introduced next anyway, because she is the co-president of the Ames Historical Society. Um, please join me in welcoming our presenter and the co-president of Ames Historical Society, Kathy Sveck. So, welcome, as Mary said, to the third lecture in our 11th annual lecture series. So we've been telling great stories for at least a decade now. And we too are just so pleased to be in a partnership with the Public Library this year. Now as a partner organization, the library assists us with promotion and they allow us to use this beautiful room at no charge, which makes it no charge for all of you too. Now, I, I think I need to just make sure that everyone can hear. Is, is it good and strong in the back? Yes. Okay, all right. Now, if for some reason I start fading away, I want you to just start moving your hands in the back of the room because I don't want you to miss anything. Um, if you've not already turned off your cell phones, be sure to do that. And we are doing a door prize at each of our lectures, and tonight's prize is the set of three Farwell Brown books on Ames history. Woohoo! So, uh, at the end of the lecture, I will be drawing the name from the jar. Um, I hope that you are all aware of the change of topic for this lecture. Now, if you are here tonight thinking that Doug Biggs is going to tell the story of the ISU football controversy from 1894 to 97, you will have to wait until next year's series. Uh, Doug had an unavoidable conflict that was imposed upon him, so we had to introduce a different topic. Uh, we do record all of our lectures, and actually the first talk in this year's series on the history of the Mary Greeley Hospital is available now in our gift shop across the street at the History Center. And so there will be some magic moment a little later when you will be able to get the entire set from this year. So uh, Alex in the back who does the videotaping also does the assembly of the DVDs, which are very, very nicely done. Um, we also have recordings of many of our past lectures, and so um, we have quite a roster to choose from by now. So if you stop over to the History Center, you can take a look at what we've got. And as always, we sincerely thank those in the audience who are members of the Ames Historical Society. Your faithful annual support provides essential funding for everything that we do, including programs like tonight's presentation. If you are not a member, we hope that you will consider becoming a member to ensure the preservation of our collective past. And the membership brochure is this little uh, burgundy job that's out on the table in the lobby. So tonight's lecture is actually an encore presentation. It was included in the very first lecture series that took place back in 2006. But it seemed like uh, when we needed a substitute program that it was definitely time to present it again. So um, uh, since that presentation in 2006, we've had a, a number of additional materials added to our Carr family collection. So you're gonna see some things that we didn't see back in 2006. But before I get started, I wanted to ask those of you in the audience if there's anyone in the room that actually knew Emmett Carr, Dad Carr. Anybody who personally knew him? Oh my gosh, Margaret, oh gosh. 
That is really special. Thank you. Now, are there Carr family members in the audience tonight? Hello, who are you? I'm Sherry. Hi, Sherry. My, my grandfather was, uh, my, my great grandfather was Emmett's brother. Emmett's brother. And his name was? His name was Knowles Carr. Knowles Carr. My grandfather was Herbert Carr. Sherry drove from Madison, Wisconsin to be here tonight for this lecture. So, uh, Sherry, we are thrilled to have you here, truly. Now, th yes, absolutely. There's still some seats up front if you want to get a little closer. Uh, so how many of you, of course, had the experience of swimming in Carr's Pool? Raise your hands. All right. <laughs> I knew there'd be a lot of people. Anybody here who worked at Carr's Pool? What did you do? Lifeguarding, okay. Oh, tiny tots, taught tiny tots and lifeguarding. Who else? What year? Uh, Margaret taught swimming. Another t uh, swimming teacher. There was another hand back here. Don? Oh, you were among the volunteers who did the repair work. Fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. Um, okay, so we had some people that taught lessons. How many people in the room took swimming lessons at CARS? Ew, lots of hands there, lots of hands there. Is there anyone now, after the new Aquatic Center opened, there were some folks that worked very hard to try to save CARS pool. Is there anybody here in the room that worked on that? Yes, Susie, I thought I saw you. <laughs> we thank you for what was a valiant, valiant effort. Well, lots of, personal, um, lots of personal relationships and stories connected with cars. Okay. Before I really get started, I want to acknowledge Donna Carr for the extraordinary gift that she gave to the Ames Historical Society of the Carr family materials. She gave them to us, but in, in essence, she gave them to the entire citizenry of Ames. The amazing pictures that you will see tonight and the materials are now accessible to future generations. Without them, I really could not have told this wonderful story tonight. And of course, uh, the Carr family, it's not just their family, it's really the story of the, for the Ames community. So we start, oops. So to start, the Skunk River had a direct influence on the development of the first public swimming pool in Ames. So sit tight and you will learn exactly how that happened. Here's a preview picture of what's to come. The river, now in the uh, lower right-hand corner, cars, sand and gravel operation in the river, and of course, the swimming pool. And this picture was taken sometime in the late 1920s. Isn't this great? I love this picture, an aerial view. So the story begins with the birth of Reuben Emmett Carr in 1878 in Union Mills, Iowa. He was the oldest of nine children, born to the Reverend and Mrs. Joseph Carr. Reverend Carr was a very dedicated man and a skilled carpenter, but his eyesight and health were poor. As the oldest child, Emmett took on family responsibilities and learned at a young age how to work. Those lessons learned at home of responsibility for others, dedication and hard work served him well throughout his entire life. In 1899, when Emmett was 21 and finished with his high school training, the Board of Education at Centerville, Iowa found him to be faithful and diligent, as well as having exceptional natural ability and fitness to be a teacher, and they unreservedly com commended him to the educational public. Emmett did not choose teaching as a profession, but these traits were true and lasting until the day he died and explained why everyone who knew him called him Dad Carr with fond affection. Emmett's willingness to work found many opportunities. He was handy with his hands. 
During the first decade of the 1900s, Emmett was the president and chief worker of the Iowa Silo Construction Company. He traveled around Iowa building masonry farm silos, and this was not the only work that kept the young man busy. Emmett moved to Ames in 1904 to try his hand at going to college. It was a venture that did not succeed, however, because his time was needed elsewhere. When an opportunity came his way to work, he took it, and this did not fit with any class schedule. Can you see that? Uh, So-and-so silo built by R.E. Carr of Ames, <coughs> Iowa. On April 20th, whoops, during interactions with a business acquaintance named George Stainer, Emmett met Mrs. Stainer's beautiful sister, Alpharita DeFore. Emmett found that she shared his dedication and dreams. They had many things in common. Both had come from families with nine children. Both their fathers were carpenters. And coincidentally enough, both sets of parents had the same first names. <laughs> Joseph and Mary. <laughs> Jeez, what was their son called? Hmm. Alpha was originally from Epworth, Iowa, born in 1883. Pretty, wasn't she? On April 20th, 1906, Emmett's father, Reverend Carr, married Emmett and Alpha in the home of her sister at 302 Lincoln Way. And this is uh, the location of the subway that's at Lincoln Way and Kellogg today. Soon after their marriage, they bought land outside the city limits along the Skunk River in the area that would become 16th Street. Emmett built a little cabin on the property and they set up housekeeping. As Emmett traveled around the state on silo business, he sent sweet letters home to his bride, telling of his travels with particular attention to the people that he met. Times were lean for the young couple. One letter from around 1908 mentioned not having an overabundance to eat. This letter closes with the rapturous statement, Oh, Alpha, I think so much of you. You can see that at the very bottom. Emmett was enterprising and good with his hands. In addition to his Iowa silo company, he operated a dairy, delivered milk over the terrible roads of the time, operated the Ames Motor Transport Company, built houses, and ran a sand and gravel business from their land by the Skunk River. In 1907, Emmett was hired at Iowa State College to teach carpentry in the Agricultural Engineering Department under J.B. Davidson. I just, I just want to point out that this little, um, this little rig, which was uh, the, uh, attached to the dredge for the sand and gravel operation, is this little contraption right down here. So this is a great picture with these heads bobbing up out of the Skunk River. Shortly after their marriage, Emmett and Alpha started to build their family. Having no children of their own, they made a home for other people's children. Alpha's mother had died when she was only 12, and the younger children in her family were sent to an orphanage for some time before she and Emmett married and took them into their home. Seeing children in an orphanage had a powerful effect on Alpha. She knew a real home was a much better place for children. In 1908, the rude little cabin gave away to him a proper home, located at the top of the hill above where Carpool was eventually located. It's right where the street named for them, Car Drive, meets 16th Street. And I know that those of you who swam in Car's Pool know that hill. The Cars had a good idea of how to nurture and raise a healthy bunch of children. The work the family did together to keep their farm running made the children feel that they were part of the family and good helpers. They had 45 acres of farmland just outside the, city's, the city limits. Skunk River ran through the property. There were many trees and rolling hills, an ideal setup for children. 
They owned four cows, grew fruit trees, a big garden, and chickens, all providing food and nutrition for the family, and many opportunities for children to learn how to work and take care of themselves. They canned about 700 quarts of fruits and vegetables every year, and the children helped with everything. There were plenty of things for kids to enjoy. There was a pony, a dog, an assortment of cats and birds. There was fishing in the river and a shady yard with swings and slides. After the family did their chores, there were many rewards. Now, I love this picture of lots of wash on the line, <laughs> indicating lots of kids. And if you'll notice in the foreground, piles of bicycles. Now here's another picture of all those bikes. Now I learned that children on their way to the pool would leave their bikes at the top to avoid the hard work of pushing them <laughs> back up that steep hill. I know some of you will remember, you know, you get out of the pool, you're all refreshed from swimming all afternoon and then you had to huff and puff up that hill and it, it took the edge off the refreshment. Over the years, the number of children who came and stayed or came and went counted up to more than 80. <coughs> Detailed records were never kept. It's possible that the number was higher. The greatest number of children together in the home at one time was 17. The average number was about eight. The children came from all walks of life. Some were, left, uh, some were left behind as travelers crossed the country looking for a place to settle. One was left by a rodeo that had stopped in Ames and went broke. There were some that spoke another language better than English. Sometimes welfare organizations, the courts, or estranged parents asked for help in caring for stranded children when there was a death, divorce, or disaster. Some of the children stayed for many years, others for only a short time. A number of children, nieces and nephews especially, came for the summer for many years. The Cars legally adopted three of these children, but accepted all others regardless of their backgrounds and circumstances. The legally adopted children were Farrell and Donna and Leslie Gerald, who was called Jack. Jack had cerebral palsy. Mr. and Mrs. Carr freely gave love, security, and care to all of them. They believed children should learn the true spirit of brotherhood and that all good things come from God. They raised the children to be good workers and contributing members of society. They were sort of an early youth and shelter services here in Ames. So now I'm going to sh uh, shift the focus and talk about swimming. Now before 1926, Ames kids had several places to swim. Uh, north of Ames was Lake Comar, a popular man-made swimming area fed by an artesian well. The Skunk River and Squaw Creek also accommodated swimmers uh, when there was water in the channels, that is. Now a favorite additional spot favored by kids was the deep hole where Emmett Carr was pumping sand out of the Skunk River. This was around 1916, and sand was in demand for paving Ames streets. Carr was a silo and house builder, but he took on the contract for the street projects. Carr was very distressed to find children using the sand pit, but he had no practical way to keep the children out. Around 1925, several near drownings prompted the community to think about building a pool. In February 1926, a petition was launched to include a pool referendum with the March city election. A bond issue of $15,000 was proposed. $15,000. Despite strong support, from, the town, from town and campus leaders and efforts to provide supporting information, only 940 voters came to the polls and 615 of them voted no. One can only conclude that Mother Nature's facilities were deemed good enough for Ames children. 
So, Emmett Carr and his wife Alpha took matters into their own hands. They announced in May 1926 that they would build a 60 by 175 foot swimming pool on their land. They owned 45 acres along two sides of the Skunk River in the area that would later become 16th Street. Efforts to secure financing for Emmett's project failed, but local contractors knew Emmett and they trusted him. They agreed to furnish most of the labor and materials and delay payments until after the pool was built and operating. Very generous. Of course, that's Emmett on the far right. When the pool was finished, Emmett Carr became the operator and manager. Carr's pool officially opened on July 4th, 1926, just 37 days after Emmett's announcement. Amazing. I love these ads. Uh, you can kind of read the descriptions. Plenty of beautiful shade, beautiful scenery, fine picnic grounds, amusements and refreshments. And down at the very bottom, Riverside Park, that's what he called the whole spread around the pool. Quite an innovation for the city of Ames. And here is the very memorable billboard at the pool that stood at the top of the bleachers. It changed over time, but this is the one that appeared at the very beginning. Capacity, 500,000 gallons. Sanitary equipment. And then the measurements, water scientifically treated. Splash day, Sunday, August 15th, Riverside Park. Swimming races, pigeon race, fancy diving. Junior Life Saving Corps will give demonstrations. Spend the day with us. Don't you love that lineup of kids on the diving board there? <laughs> and you can see that the, um, immediately outside the pool, it was just sand. So kids would run around and, uh, must have been a lot of sand residue in the bottom of the pool in those days. Water for the pool was pumped from a deep well below the riverbed. Perkins Labs was contracted to monitor and maintain water quality equal to drinking water. Water was circulated through a sand filtration system and returned to the pool at 500 gallons a minute through an active fountain in the shallow end. Did y'all know that? That fountain wasn't just decorative. It was part of the uh, purification system. Very little chemical use was required to keep 450,000 gallons of water very clean. In 1946, Carr's Pool received the highest award in a national contest for safe, clean water. At the start, the shallow end measured one and a half feet, the deep end, eight feet. Depth was later modified to two feet at the shallow end and 11 feet at the deep end. A two-level diving tower was located at the deep end along with other diving boards. Don't you love those old cars in the background there? Genuine Tom Thumb Golf. So that was another attraction uh, near the pool. Showers in the bathhouse were gravity fed by an overhead tank and were always cold. <laughs> you can see the uh, the tank right here in this picture. So that's what fed the showers in the uh, bathhouse. Now the floating tops in the deep end were a very distinctive feature of the pool and provided hours of king of the mountain sorts of contests between groups of swimmers. I remember they were always boys. <laughs> taking over the tops. And this uh, picture at the top I think is a very sweet picture, very early of a group of kids in the pool. The wood frame bathhouse provided a basket checkout system rather than lockers. 
The baskets were numbered and each had a corresponding round brass tag with a string that was worn on one's wrist or pinned or looped onto a swimming suit. And I'm sure you remember those little brass tags. So here's the basket checkout. Don <laughs> there they are. Donna Carr recalled that the earliest Carr's pool baskets were made of thin woven wooden strips, much like laundry baskets of the day. Later they were metal. Baskets bearing the numbers 100s and 200s were reserved for males and were shelved on the south side by the men's changing area. Uh, baskets numbered in the 300s and 400s were for females and they were shelved on the north side. On hot summer weekends, several shifts of young employees were needed to staff the basket checkout. On such occasions, swimmers often numbered over 500, and baskets with those numbers had to be stacked in the rear area. Now, some swimmers chose to memorize their basket number and thus avoid the hassle of the little tag, because inevitably, tags came off of swimming suits and became lost. But many swimmers voluntarily joined in searching for them in the bottom of the pool. <laughs> You know, this picture is uh, of a basket that we have in our collection. The thing we do not have is one of those little tags. So if any of you are harboring a brass tag from cars, <laughs> we want it. A short-lived 50-foot high dive was installed in the 1930s, but it was removed immediately after a miscalculated dive ended with an injury. All persons were welcome. Young, old, handicapped, disabled, no child ever went without a chance to swim if Carr knew about it. He always had odd jobs, such as raking the grounds, picking up pop bottles, or other such chores for needy youngsters. For many years, the pool sponsored Wednesday morning free swims. Later, a fee of five cents was charged. The pool was so crowded on these bargain days that it was difficult to find a place to get in. Now, I love this picture of Donna in the concession stand. And if you look closely, you can clearly see all those great brands of candy bars, Baby Ruth, all the rest. In the 1920s and 30s, swimming exhibitions were presented on Saturday evenings by college swim team members. On summer evenings, the high school band played concerts at the pool, providing a pleasant gathering spot for the community. Carr called the area around the pool Riverside Park. It featured picnic tables with stone fireplaces and pure spring water. There were basketball, volleyball, and tennis courts. The Tom Thumb miniature golf course Carr developed at the park featured plantings, a rock garden with a fountain, and artistic landscaping with 20 varieties of flowers. Emmett had ideas for a resort-style uh, tourist cabins north of the golf course, and though they never materialized, it would have made a complete recreation experience. I think that's Emmett on the right, poking up above the flowers. In 1936, Emmett's friend, musician Harvey Stern, was recuperating from an illness and needed something to do. Emmett loved music and thought all kids should learn how to play a musical instrument, so he had Harvey teach some kids how to play the bugle and drums. Before long, a drum and bugle corps developed under Harvey's direction. From just a few Carr family kids, the Corps grew to include 112 area youngsters. The Drum and Bugle Corps continued until 1941. Young Donna Carr loved drumming and she became a state champion. An interesting footnote is that Harvey wrote the Ames High School fight song. Aren't these great pictures of the bugle corps? Those are pretty precise 
uh, formations, if you ask me. Dad Carr was always resourceful where children were concerned. He also operated a roller skating rink from 1938 to 48 at the Ames High Field House, a space that he rented from the school district. The round structure was near the intersection of Grand Avenue and Lincoln Way. When his lease on the field house was not renewed in 1948, he bought a portable skating floor in Esterville, Iowa for one dollar, hauled it to Ames and set it up under a tent south of the pool. Emmett was good with his hands. Carr strongly believed that every child should learn to swim, possibly because, amazingly, he himself could not swim. <laughs> thousands upon thousands of children were enrolled in swimming classes at Carr's pool. In this picture, that's dad right in the middle in the straw hat. I love that picture. At first, Carr hired the instructors. Later, he turned um, he turned this program over to the Red Cross, but he continued to insist that every child have a chance to be in the classes, so he agreed to share the additional costs with the Ames Playground Committee. This ensured that all elementary school children could be enrolled. Lessons were conducted on weekday mornings during the summer. A swimming program for crippled children started at the Iowa State College pool and was moved to Carr's in 1951, with Carr donating use of the pool. He thought that swimming was the one sport open to physically handicapped persons. The Crippled Children's Society, also known as Easter Seals, received financial aid from Kiwanis International to help pay the instructors. The program continued until 1975. Some of you may remember Jeff Benson of our community. He recalled taking lessons, lessons through this program. Now the program that was dearest to Carr's generous heart was his Tiny Tots program for those children two to six years of age. It originated in 1950 by Carr and his daughter Donna at their own expense and served fewer than 100 children the first year. This innovative program was such a success that in 1951, Kiwanis lent financial support. Originally, mothers joined their children in the water. No fees were charged and the cars donated the pool. As the program grew and instructors had to be hired, a small fee was charged and the Kiwanis continued to provide support. Tiny Tots director, Donna Carr, I know, it's, it's someone we know. <laughs> Tiny Tots director, Donna Carr, found that high school students were talented instructors who worked well with young children. In classes, each instructor handled two two-year-olds at a time, three three-year-olds, or a group of five older children. Although not all tots learned to swim, many learned to float or reduce their fear of the water and all became accustomed to learn a learning situation that would help them adjust when they started school. By 1960, 22 instructors were employed and 846 children were enrolled. Enrollments and numbers of sessions continued to expand through 1968 when three sessions serving nearly 1,300 children after the 1974 uh, season, the Tiny Tots program was moved away from cars to the more climate-controlled indoor municipal pool that had been built at Ames High School. One thing many Tots graduates clearly remember is how cold the water was in the mornings. You can see that quote, my younger sister vividly remembered her goosebumps. In the early 1950s, Carr was beginning, uh, began to think of retiring from the pool business and offered to sell it to the city in 1952. He was 74 years old at that time. Another referendum was organized and despite the popularity of the pool, it too was voted down. After that, Emmett's daughter Donna took a stronger role in managing the pool. 
After Dad died in 1957 at the age of 79, Gary Carr, Donna's nephew, moved from Fort Dodge to manage the pool. Gary had been raised by Emmett and spent many hours at the pool. In March 1972, the city of Ames finally purchased the pool from the Carr family for $69,270 and transferred its management to the Ames Parks and Recreation Department. To honor its long history, the city retained the name Carr Pool. And this purchase was just uh, supported as a capital expenditure rather than putting it up to a vote. When Emmett passed away on June 22, 1957, he and Alpha had been married for 51 remarkable years. They were perfectly united in their beliefs and efforts toward the welfare of children. In addition to those who lived with them, all the children of Ames who used their farm, swimming pool, and skating rink came under their watchful eyes. Dad was known for his firm but friendly brand of supervision. He and Alpha lived a life of unselfishness, dedicated to service, and were pillars in the Ames community. Despite their many business enterprises, their efforts were never about money, and their wealth was measured in the currency of young lives. Dad was a deeply spiritual man who was never showy or preachy. His spirituality was constantly nurtured by his service to others. He used to say, God is like electricity. You can't see it, but you know it's there. You flick a switch and there is light or power. He was always flicking the switch by way of his service to others. One of dad's favorite sayings was, you cannot give away kindness. Folks always return it. Mom Carr was equally shy in the public spotlight. In a rare interview when asked about what she considered important in raising children, she spoke clearly about putting children on their own feet, teaching them how to do things for themselves and letting them feel proud of their accomplishments. She also pointed out that children must know that their help is needed in the home. As if to downplay her own contributions and dad's, she was quick to observe that the children had also given them much and had kept them young at heart. Alpha died on December 3rd, 1970. She was 87 years old, or young if you count all those children. The car's remarkable love and talent for children drew attention. They were featured in numerous newspapers here in Ames and elsewhere, including the Philadelphia Inquirer. Magazines carried articles including Look, American Mag Magazine, and Pageant. Mom and Dad Carr were interviewed on several national radio programs, including the December 27, 1938 broadcast of We the People in New York City. You can see that on the left. Now, amazingly, that radio program was recorded and preserved on uh, an old-fashioned 78 record. And it is in our collection, and so I'm going to play it for you. And uh, the, the record was a little bit scratched, so there's a little bit of static. But listen carefully, and you can hear first a little radio skit, and then Alpha in her own voice and Dad Carr in his own voice. So let's see. Many years ago, to an orphanage near Ames, Iowa, there came a daily visitor, Mrs. Reuben Emmett Carr. Each day she would come to visit her little orphan friends and bring them gifts and read to them. One day she was just leaving when a five-year-old friend, Jackie, came running after her. Oh, Mrs. Carr, are you going home now? Yes, Jackie. Where do you live, Mrs. Carr? In the house? Yes. We live in a farmhouse just a little way from here. You have real cows there? And chickens? Yes, Jackie. Oh, Mrs. Carr, why can't I go there and live with you? I'd be a good boy, honest. Well, Jackie, I'll please, Mrs. Carr, take me with you. I want to go home with you. I... 
I'm sorry, Jackie. I wish I could. That night, Reuben Carr came into the kitchen of his home, found his wife sitting by the window. Why, Alpha, what's the matter? Oh, I'm so lonely. If we only had some children in the house. I know, dear. That little boy at the orphanage, Jackie, he wants to come here and live with us. Well, dear, I... Oh, why can't we take it? We don't have a lot of money, but I'm sure we can move. Well, dear, why don't we try? Three days later, Mrs. Carr brought Jackie home. She so began a story that will grip you as few human experiences can. You'll hear the rest of it from the lips of Mr. and Mrs. Carr. They've come all the way from Ames, Iowa, to tell it to you. Thank you, Coffee is proud to present Mrs. Reuben Emmett Carr. Jackie brought new happiness to our home. He loved having someone to call Mother and Dad. One year later, we decided to give two more orphan children a home. We weren't wealthy, but there is always plenty to eat on our farm. As the children grew older, they began to help us with the chores around the place. So we all pulled together. And as the years went by, we took more homeless children into our family, added to our little brood, and as the first children grew up and went out into the world, we brought in others to take their place. But Jackie, our first little fellow, still lives on the farm with us. At one time, we had 16 children living with us. In all, there have been 56, and there are seven living with us today. Many of them have married, and their children call me mom. Our children are scattered all over the United States. But each Christmas, as many come, as can come home for a family reunion. A lot of people seem to think we've done something wonderful. Well, Dad and I don't. We wanted children and didn't have any of our own. Our lives have been rich and full because of the happiness those children brought us. My husband is right here beside me. He feels the same way, don't you, Dad? I sure do. I never feel lonesome with a mess of, mess of kids around. And bringing them up, well, you might say it's been my feeling. And making them happy makes us happy. And I guess that's all a man can ask for tonight. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Carr, I know everybody agrees with you and everybody respects you for what you've done. Now, I've got a little surprise for you. You know when it was decided that you would appear on We the People? Well, we wrote to all your 56 children. And all day telegrams have been arriving, pouring in. And the last one just came from Santa Monica, California. Now, I've got them here, 56 telegrams and all. All of your children are listening in tonight. And I know they must be very, very proud of you. Mr. Peter, this is the happiest moment of my life. God bless them all. We the people, speak. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Now, there are a few very interesting footnotes to the carpool history. In 1936, the polio scare kept swimmers away from the pool until public health officials determined how the disease spread. The pool operation was, was affected by social attitudes of the day. Carr's generosity in allowing all types of people to use the pool encountered difficulty due to prevailing social attitudes of racial segregation and prejudice. But even within the terrible restrictions of the times, he allowed African American children to swim in the mornings. After World War II in 1946, a petition was submitted to Carr asking that African Americans be allowed to swim whenever the pool was open. He knew that fairness demanded that very thing, but he had a business to run. It was a terrible, terrible dilemma for him. Carr asked for written letters of assurance from the petitioners that white customers would not stay away. When he received no assurance, he did not change his policy. But over time, racial attitudes did change. 
1957, city water service was extended to the pool and the deep well and original filtration system were no longer required. In 1965, 18 of Carr's original 45 acres were sold to the city of Ames for incorporation into city park land. This tract was Carr's timbered land east of the Skunk River. It had never been developed and became an important link in the green space development along the river. It is now called Carr Woods. In 1976, the Carr home at 16th and Carr Drive was torn down to make way for new residential construction. Also in 1976, to celebrate the pool's 50th anniversary and the nation's bicentennial, five cent swimming was offered. But in this festive year, serious needed repairs threatened to close the pool. Reminiscent of the volunteers that helped Dad Carr build the pool in 1926, volunteers again came forward in 1977 to provide repairs to a leaking pipe that, and these repairs kept the pool open and operating. Some of you may remember that. In 1982 and 83, major structural renovations marked the final year of the original pool basin after 56 years of operation. Volunteers rebuilt the pool and also provided improvements in paving around the pool, concrete surfacing, and a modern bathhouse facility. A continual theme in the Cars Pool story is the matter of failed referendums for swimming facilities. There was the 1926 rejection that launched Carr's Pool at the very beginning. Then, when Emmett wanted to retire, there was the 1952 proposal to buy the pool for $50,000 that did not pass. In 1958, a year after Emmett died, the Chamber of Commerce studied the issue of swimming facilities, but no initiatives came from that study. In 1977, a bond issue was put to a vote to make repairs to Carr's Pool buy and upgrade the pool at the old country club, and to build a new pool in West Ames. Needless to say, this also failed, prompting the volunteer effort, oops, uh, prompting the volunteer repair effort at CARS. By 2005, swimming facilities were woefully undersized for the growing community, but a referendum that proposed both indoor and outdoor facilities was rejected as being too extravagant. Finally, a downsized aquatic center was approved in July 2007 for an eight and a half million dollar bond issue. Two million had been donated by Donald and Ruth Furman and an additional one million dollar gift came from an anonymous donor. Of course, still unresolved is what to do with the city and school district's shared indoor pool at the high school that, has, uh, that is very close to reaching the end of its useful life. But after the 2007 bond issue passed, the question of what would become of carpool came to the forefront. The pool officially closed after the, after the 2009 season. A valiant effort was made by a dedicated group that wanted to keep carpool as a secondary facility but the movement gained no traction among major donors or city council and the pool remained closed. In 2012, the carpool basin was demolished, which was a very poignant moment for many swimmers. The bathhouse was saved for reuse and the area around it was filled in and developed into parkland adjacent to the River Valley bike trail. Though the physical pool has ended, the memories live on for generations of swimmers. Now here are some photos through time and a short video from, car, from the car pool scrapbook. And this is just, uh, kind of, they're kind of in chronological order, so you can see the changes in the pool and you can see the changes in swimming fashions as we go. So this picture is of the many uh, formats that the pool pass took over the years. So here's 1929, everyone in the little uh, bib swimming suits. Again, 1929, a very brave young person at the top of the fountain, yikes. 1930, 
1930s, packed pool with all those great cars around the edges. Again, 1930s, more great pictures of the cars. Nineteen thirty seven. This is a great picture. That young boy is Gary Carr, who grew up to be the manager. And of course, uh, all the car kids uh, had their experiences in the pool. There's the original fence that was around the pool. Nineteen thirty nine, another great picture of Emmett talking to kids in the pool. And again you can see the sand pathway around the edge of the pool. Now hopefully some of you remember the steps that went down into the pool. Now do you remember what you could do with those steps? Yes, you can swim underneath it. If you could hold your breath, you could swim from one side to the other because the steps were not enclosed, they were open. Needless to say, OSHA had not been invented yet. <laughs> But that was a showing of your prowess as a swimmer, if you could hold your breath long enough to swim under the steps. 1939, Donna again in the concession stand. Can you see this? <laughs> Bottle of pop for five cents. 1945, all the kids enrolled in swimming lessons. Bunches of kids in swimming lessons. 1951-52, uh, this does appear to be swimming, more swimming lessons. Instructors and kids trying to be brave. Again, 51-52, I think these are some of the mothers that initially uh, helped out with their Tiny Tots program. Fifty-two, there's a lifeguard in, their, uh, in her spot, and a great picture on the lower left of the bleachers and some of the high diving boards. So this is a very rare picture of the pool empty. This was at the beginning of the season. They were getting it cleaned up. Um, the wrinkles that you see are in the negative, but we were pleased to be able to still see the picture that charming little tot perched on the fountain is Patsy Carr, class of 66. 53, 54, again, some of the uh, diving platforms, diving paraphernalia. Still has the slide. 1956, uh, we're beginning to see the changes in the swimming fashions here. There's a great dive series. Woohoo! That entry in the water looks pretty good to me. 1957. Great picture of the tops here in the deep end. Obviously not so many swimmers in the deep end, a lot more on the shallow end. Now here are some interesting shots because uh, initially, of course, Carr's Pool was um, pretty far away from town. But town obviously uh, was continuing to grow in that direction, so the top picture is the Carr Farm there in the center um, in the 1930s. And then by 1948, the developments were definitely growing toward the pool and the farm, which is over here. And then here's a picture in 1957, uh, and again, uh, uh, moving much, much, much closer to the pool. So look at all these little houses. Now they all have very mature trees in their front yards, but. This little film was uh, courtesy of Doug Eggers, a little home movie that was taken. We assume one of these charming small children is Doug, but he has not told us which one he is. <laughs> Climbing the slide. This 
Isn't it great to actually see a moving picture of those kids? And you had to just make that circuit as fast as you could. You slid down, climbed out, scurried up the ladder, and back down again. Oh, that kid. <laughs> Not quite brave enough yet. Yeah. <laughs> That billboard showing the Red Cross sign for swimming lessons. <laughs> I sympathize with that kid. I was not a very brave swimmer either. This is a great uh, view out the deep end of the pool with the diving tower and the kids playing on the tops. Oh. <laughs> Look at that, tipping over, woo! Good dive there. Lifeguard. Couple more, sorry. 77. Bikinis by now. Two piece suits. In 83, the Kiwanis donated two diving boards. So this is Art Gowan, Rod Fox, and Lloyd Kurtz, who had a tremendous influence on the park system in Ames. This was, uh, this was a part of that 83 renovation where the new bathhouse was built. 2001, there's that new bathhouse. Great pictures of the pool in more recent times, 2008. 2009, the last season at Cars. And here is a staff member from the Ames Historical Society collecting a bottle of water from the last filling of the pool. And we still have that bottle of water, so a precious artifact. Now this is the pool, this is the view, uh, the current view of the place where park, uh, Cars Pool used to stand. So this is at the top of that long hill and we're going down, down. Come on. Down, down, down. And here we are at the bottom where Cars used to be. Beautiful green lawn. Now you can clap. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have just a, any short anecdotes that you would like to share with the crowd about cars? Any comments or questions? Yeah, throw the back. George Montgomery, I'm class of 1966. Hi, George. What I remember. Stand up and speak loud. What I remember is not only being able to be on the tops and being on being able to climb on the mountain, you know, which was so dangerous. I don't know how many times I fell off and I just never really got hurt. But the really cool thing was the separating uh, line. I saw it in the one of those slides. Originally were actually fence posts, they were like six inch diameter logs that were held together by a chain. I can remember swimming toward them and thinking I was diving underneath them. And then he'd come up too soon and bang. <laughs> <laughs> about anything that you did there, that's what 
was so amazing about it. <laughs> that you were just allowed to play. Yeah, just to play. To yep. Free and do what you want. It was pretty cool. It was. This is terribly. Thank you, George. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, over here. When the city bought it, the, the apostrophe S disappeared. So it was carpool after 1972. Yeah, other questions? Is the bathhouse being used for anything now? You know, that is a really good question. Uh, the question was, is the bathhouse being used? I suspect it's being used for storage, but I don't really know. Because it, it was an open air, it continues to be an, kind of an open air structure. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on with that. Yeah. Yeah, would you stand up? We lived on Meadow Lane, just down the street from Cars Pool, and we always bought a season ticket. We had four kids, and I believe the ticket cost $60, and we got every bit of that money to work out of that ticket. Our kids were there two, maybe so, three times a day sometimes. So they live down there. They live down there, two or three times a day. Yep, they swim in the morning, come home for lunch, and then swim in the afternoon. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. My name is Judy Lemish, and I grew up here in Ames, too. And we lived on the west side of town, and this was before the municipal pool. So I remember getting on our little bikes and riding all the way across <laughs> the Iowa State. We were just west of the college. So we had to ride all the way down there, and you're right about that hill. <laughs> so, yeah, you had to be pretty, um, pretty good to get up that hill on the way home without getting too hot again. You want to go back down and go back. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long trek from West Ames. It really was. Yeah, go ahead. I would, I would like to add to her comments. That hill was hot and dusty and bumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Going down was great. It was the coming up that was really hard. Other comments? Questions? Kathy? Yeah. Going down the hill was okay unless the city had put the new pea gravel on. <laughs> you wanted to be real careful going down. And I guess the other thing is uh, they used to blow the whistle and make us get out of the pool for 15 minutes and everybody had to go sit in the stand for 15 minutes okay. every hour. I didn't remember that. Okay, okay. Anything else? Yeah. Can you, can you tell us a little about the next generation of cars? You said there were three that were adopted and what happened to that next generation? The next generation, I don't know. I may have to rely on Sherry there in the back to help me out with this one. Uh, Donna is still living in Ames. She is well into her 90s now. And um, uh, she, there, there are no children with Donna. Farrell was the other one. I, I'm trying to figure out if Farrell was Patsy's dad. And so there are additional cars. Do you guys know? And then Jack, uh, the little boy with cerebral palsy, I am not sure how long he lived or when he died. So I'm not sure. Uh, the, the thing is that with those huge families on both sides, there were dozens and dozens of cousins, nieces, and nephews. And those families are out there continuing to expand, I'm sure. Lynette? Um, I live on our property. Uh -huh. And as I understood it, the provision in their will was that if Donna didn't stay in the house or, or take care of him, then the house in the land would be sold. And oh. that happened in um, 1976. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. Thank you. But even as I wanted to say, all three of my kids, of course, lived at car school. That was my babysitter. They were all my cars. And the youngest one was born in age two. He still laughs about how I would just tell him in the morning or as soon as the pool opened, go to the pool. <laughs> and then, you know, he'd come home to eat 
and then you need to go back. To so <laughs> you can do that today, but that was pretty recent. Daycare, cars, pool, and daycare <laughs> for lots of generations of kids. One last comment from anybody? You know, I had, a, I had a question back when I presented this talk the first time, if anyone drowned in carpool. And as far as I know, uh, the answer to that is no. Um, certainly while the car family was managing the pool, there were no fatalities at the pool. So that is an amazing record. Yeah, in the back. Yes, there was one drowning, uh, a young man named Wayne Solis. Okay. But, but just the one. Yeah, as far as I know. So just the one. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I think we're going to do the drawing for the door prize. And this is, oh, oh. Got to give everyone a fair chance, right? Okay, so this is for the set of three uh, Ames History books by Farwell Brown. This is uh, Laverne Fadley. Is Laverne there? Hey, hey! <laughs> you can see, uh, uh, oh, here's uh, Casey right at the door. I want to thank you all so much for coming and for being a great audience and for adding to our lore on Carr's Pool. Thank you. Thank you.